Preparations are on the way regionally for the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women that takes place at the United Nations headquarters in New York from the 15th to the 26th of March, 2021. The theme this year is women's full and effective participation and decision-making in public life, as well as the elimination of violence for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. And with us is Ms. Anne-Marie Williams, Deputy Program Manager within the Gender and Development Subprogram of the CARICOM Secretariat. Ms. Williams, thank you for joining us. Thank you too. Before we get into CARICOM's preparations ahead of CSW 65, I wanted to talk briefly about the state of women in the region. And th this is based on the adoption or the ratification of agreements under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. What is the state of women in the region? Well, to Sankin, um, truth be told, we have made some progress. It would be impossible for us not to have made some progress. But let me tell you, progress has been slow and uneven. Take, for example, this is the last year we celebrated well it, we're still in the 25th anniversary of the beijing declaration of platform for action which is the most comprehensive roadmap to achieve gender equality globally after 25 years the issues that the different member states in the region have signed on to following the beijing platform the issues still remain relevant and we're having even a resurgence of Take, for example, violence. Violence happens to be one of the platforms of the Beijing Declaration. And it is difficult to achieve gender equality if women and girls are plagued by violence. The other thing is women in decision making. And when we talk about decision making, if we want to measure our progress, we think about decision making at the highest levels. And we think of women in political decision making. We have not, not made the kind of mm. progress in that area. When we look at issues where women are still in non-traditional fields, women still work in certain areas. They work a lot in caring areas they still have not been able to jump over that job segregation. Men work this way and women work that way. There's still the sexual division of labor. When we look at unpaid care work and domestic work, where women still do two thirds of the world's work and only receive one thirds of the world's pay. But a good thing that I want to say is that we, in the meantime, there's great work going on in that, for the first time, the region has done five prevalent survey in the, in the area of gender-based violence, particularly intimate partner violence, to measure where the region is in terms of violence. What is not counted, you don't know exactly what interventions to apply to it. So the five prevalent survey didn't really tell us something new because we know that worldwide, globally, one in three women will be violated during her lifetime. And that was articulated in the survey in essentially in Jamaica, Trinidad, Grenada, Suriname, but in Guyana, it's one in two women. And so that shows you that we need specific interventions because that cannot, continue to happen. It doesn't begin to count when we speak about gender equality. Mm -hmm. When we look at women's unpaid care work and domestic work, for the first time in the 2022 round of censuses next year, five member states have agreed to pilot questions in their census to measure women's unpaid care and domestic work. That is magnificent from where I sit. Magnificent because 
although Trinidad and Tobago did a round of questions in 2000, Trinidad did some, Jamaica did a piece, but it's not enough to do a comparative analysis across and between countries in the, in the region. So now five countries will be doing that next year, which is tremendous. There's a spotlight initiative that, that is a program with national programs and regional level programs providing upwards of 500 million euros across the world to fight different kinds of violence in the region in the Caribbean, it's family violence. And so there's family violence being fought, there's, there's trafficking, there's harmful practices, femicide. So it's an effort to really look at how quick we could stem this scourge of violence among women and girls. The inclusion of the um, women's unpaid work in the census analysis is very interesting and it certainly validates the whole conversation on women's unpaid care, mm -hmm. care work in the domestic arena. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we certainly have to touch on that and how uneven the impact has been on women and girls. They have, from our personal experiences and um, anecdotal observation being disproportionately affected by the pandemic. What has been your own observations? Well, it's not only my observation, it's hard data coming out. UN ECLAC is saying that, and IDB has said it, a number of agencies have, that 118 million women and girls, it is estimated, will slip deeper into poverty during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that from the lockdown started in about March here in the region, we know that women who have been disproportionately affected, a lot of them work in the informal sector, they work in the tourism sector. This is a region that is very much tourism based. And women work, particularly in the lower rungs of the tourism ladder. They were the first to lose their jobs. Mm. If you look closely at it, when those kind of workers lost their jobs, they have no safety net. They have no social protection. They largely work off the cuff. They work on their own and some of them who are own account workers in that they're crafts, women and artisan, they, there's, because tourism is not booming, there's no work for them mm -hmm, either. Mm -hmm. And so we find that besides the poverty, there's women on due burden of care also during the pandemic because there's a lockdown, the children are not at school, they have to help them they have to take care of all the chores in the house. Mm -hmm, and if mm -hmm. they are working, they too mm -hmm. have to do their own work. Mm -hmm. So they have suffered disproportionately on undue burden of care. Mm -hmm. Along with, again, gender-based violence, a lot of women have been locked down with their perpetrators. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you really report? So a lot of what has been going on, women have been suffering the brunt of it, women and girls. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact too that because of the economic downturn, a lot of our boys who had to leave school, boys and girls, but a lot of our boys will never return to school. A lot of our girls will become teenage mothers. And these are some of the issues. The inequalities in our region didn't just come because of COVID. But COVID has laid bare the inequalities and made us realize that as a region, we really have to put policies in place to fight it, not in silos. It's not a Guyana problem or a Belize problem or a Jamaica problem. It's a regional problem. And what are we going to do to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 in order to build back equal? Mm -hmm. uh, precisely, because the COVID-19 pandemic and those issues it has laid bare certainly has to change the priorities in addressing um, empowerment of women and equality generally. You just mentioned mm -hmm. the um, issues that boys face. Mm -hmm. 
And so the, the, the numbers really tell you about Latin America and the Caribbean. Another, another factor too, in this region, we have a lot of artisans, people in the cultural industries. Those people are not even working mm -hmm. because um, we think about our DJs, we think about our musicians, we think about our storytellers. They can't catch a break because things are slowly just beginning or mm -hmm. slowly just trying to look up. Mm -hmm. But this virus is wrecking havoc and it's like until until the vaccination is really wide, it's like we won't catch a break. But these are things that we have to remember that both on the front lines, because women bear the brunt on the front line too. They make up the majority of the healthcare workers, mm -hmm. right? So it's working, working out at risk for the virus, taking it home, having all the chores home. But some of the men have also taken part in unpaid care work during this certainly, time. Certainly, certainly. So it has brought it has brought a good thing in that respect because it's an opportunity for them to take part in their shared responsibility because mm -hmm. housework or domestic work is not women's work. It's everybody's work, but because it's not been valued and a lot of economists say that it's hard to count, it's not a part of national accounts and it's what are women's work. It's, it's not, it's not an important part of GDP and mm -hmm. so countries don't count it. Mm -hmm. But we feel that getting this data and starting this conversation was put the light on exactly what, what our governments are losing by not counting women's unpaid care okay. and domestic work. So I want to ask you before we get into the regional preparatory meeting ahead of CSW 65, about what do you think um, the priorities should be when we talk about how COVID-19 has impacted women unevenly and the gender disparities that are growing wider and wider, what do you think the priority should be in resetting um, the empowerment of, of women and girls and for gender equality? Well, the priorities are exactly what the CARICOM statement is talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could segue into that, because it dovetails perfectly. The priorities must be how do we get women back to work? Data in the region show you that about almost, almost a half of women who work at the lower socioeconomic rung will not return to work because of mm -hmm. childcare issues and not able to get enough money because a lot of places have gone half pay, some have cut pay. So, so it's like the unemployed and the underemployed. So, so we have to put women and men back to work, but particularly women back to work. There's lots of single mothers. I mean, who takes care of them? We have to look at the issue of childcare in a holistic way because women should not have to choose between do I go to work or do I stay home and take care of my children because I'm not getting paid enough to afford childcare? Then we also have to look at how we how we take care of our hospitals and our and our different health health posts and health sites. I want us to get now into the regional regional preparatory meeting ahead of uh, CSW six to five. Um, why is it important for us to prepare ahead of this global discussion in March? And what are we expecting from our regional level of preparation and from the global discussion later on? Well, a lot of the issues we just spoke about is, is contained in what is known as the CARICOM position. So it's a statement about maybe 20, 25 paragraphs long premise on the theme, women's full and effective participation and decision making in public life and the effects of gender-based violence, which will definitely cause gender inequality. So that's the theme, but we know that there is nothing you can think about that doesn't have a gender dynamic attached to it. And nothing that you can think about that doesn't affect women. So because of that, 
the statement really pulls apart the different issues. It looks at, at what the, how the region feels about gender budgeting. It, it reaffirms initially that the region has signed on to CEDA, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. That's a Bill of Rights for Women. The region has signed on to the convention to punish, to punish and eradicate violence against women. It's an OAS convention or the convention on Belém do Para. It has signed on to, to the climate agreement. It, it, so all the different instruments and conventions it has signed on to forms the foundation of the document. The, the Samoa pathway. So we we look at women's inequalities. We look at how rural women fare in agriculture. We look at indigenous women. We look in the statement about women's sexual and reproductive health and mm -hmm. rights. We also look at, there's a whole section on, on, on COVID-19. There's a whole section on gender inequality, a section on violence, a mm -hmm. section on political participation. And each country has an opportunity. The National Gender Machinery Head gets the statement and the, the ministers of gender also. And they look at the statement and flesh out what they would like to see in the statement. And so the statement has myriad of issues that are germane to the region. And that is what we will have some sort of semblance of agreement on and we will adopt the statement on Friday, which is tomorrow, our, meet, our last day of our two-day meeting. And the statement will go forward to be included in an outcome document that the Commission and the Status of Women 65 produces every time there's a CSW meeting. So the document has the Caribbean region perspective. It has Latin America. It has the U.S. It has, it has all the different perspectives, if you could imagine that. And so there's heavy negotiation that usually goes on at CSW, but this time it's virtual. I'm not sure how it's going to work. We're about to see, mm -hmm. but we have put together the statement and tomorrow is an opportunity for the ministers to see the statement and have a discussion as to what can be added, what can be subtracted or like that. But it's, it's important to have a coordinated position as a region because there's no homogeneity in terms of regions. Mm -hmm. We are different. Yes, there are a few things that we're similar on, but our differences shouldn't divide us. It should really unite us. And because of that, we do the different statements because diversity is king. Okay. We, we, we achieve much more when we could actually make diversity work mm -hmm. for us. Uh, Ms. Williams, thank you very much for um, sharing with us CARICOM's priorities in the global discussion on the state of women, the Commission on Women in New York in March, and letting us um, know and reminding us how important it is to mainstream issues pertaining to gender, the empowerment of women and girls in policy for sustainable development and for building back better post-COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you.